This is Chemical Processes for Micro and Nano Fabrication, Fall 2013 semester at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm Chris Mack, the professor for this class. And this is Lecture 1, Semiconductor Overview. Our reading for this chapter, or for this lecture, is Chapter 1 of our textbook for the course, Stephen Campbell's Fabrication Engineering at the Micro and Nano Scale, 4th edition. Today we're going to talk about what a semiconductor is and the basics of semiconductor processing. So what is a semiconductor? We know what an insulator is. It's something that doesn't conduct electricity well. We know what a conductor is. It's something that does conduct electricity well. It's tempting to think that a semiconductor must be something in between a conductor and an insulator, but that is definitely not the case. That is not what a sem semiconductor is. A semiconductor is a material whose conductivity can be varied by many orders of magnitude. Two, three, four, five, six orders of magnitude for good semiconductors like silicon. This allows us to switch between being an insulator and being a, a conductor. And there are lots of different ways that semiconductors can be switched between insulating and conducting properties. For example, temperature. Most conductors when you raise the temperature, they become worse conductors. Their resistivity goes up. Metals all behave like this. Semiconductors behave in the opposite way. When you raise the temperature of a semiconductor, they become better conductors. In fact, this is one of the primary tests we use to determine if a material is a semiconductor or not. If the rise in temperature corresponds with the rise in conductivity. Uh, this allows us to use semiconductors for temperature sensing applications, for example. We can also vary the conductivity with light. Shine light on it and the conductivity goes up. Uh, we'll see a little bit why that happens in this class. We won't talk much about it, but it enables semiconductors to be used as light detectors. One of the primary ways in which we switch the conductivity of a semiconductor is with doping. We'll talk a little bit more about doping today and then we'll have a whole uh, a couple of lectures later on in the semester on the process of doping semiconductor materials. That means we apply, uh, add into the crystal structure of silicon a different material that has a different electronic structure compared to silicon and therefore changes the conductivity. We can change the conductivity with an electric field, that is by applying a voltage across some region of the semiconductor. These last two um, uh, bullet items, doping and electric field, these last two ways of changing the conductivity of a semiconductor can be applied locally over a very small scale. This allows us to build small switches where sometimes it's an insulator, sometimes it's a conductor, sometimes it's on, sometimes it's off. And this will be the fundamental way in which we use semiconductors in electrical circuits. Lots and lots of little switches wired together to make circuits. As I said, this allows us to make the semiconductor into a switch. The two most common kinds of switches are current controlled switches and voltage controlled switches. Bipolar transistors, the first kinds of transistors that were made in the history of the semiconductor industry and still useful in many applications today are current controlled switches. Apply a current, you turn the transistor on or off, turn the switch open or closed. A voltage controlled switch is like a MOSFET, metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. We'll talk more about those as the semester goes on. These are voltage controlled switches. We apply a voltage, we change the switch to be open or closed. MOSFETs are the primary semiconductor device in, in CMOS circuits and digital logic circuits. So all of our memory and our um, logic circuits, uh, all of our digital logic is made up of MOSFETs. So we'll see a lot of that. It's the primary device in the modern world of semiconductor manufacturing. So with this semiconductor, we need to do some processing to create these small regions that we can switch between being a conductor and an insulator. The semiconductor processing falls into two basic categories. The first category is called patterning. This is where we create small interconnected 3D structures that are made up of insulators, semiconductors, and conductors. That is the physical material that turns into a switch. This allows us to 
apply local manipulation of the electric field by applying voltage and therefore changing the current, uh, switching our device to be on or off. But we also need to be able to dope locally. And doping the semiconductor region in some in semiconductor in some small region allows us to create PN junctions. We'll talk about what that is later, but it's the basic junction between doped and undoped or doped in different ways, materials doped in different ways, and it allows us to create the electrical components like diodes and transistors that we're hoping for. And this allows us the local manipulation of the charge carrier concentration. Now, for wires, metal conductors, we're used to thinking, well, charge is carried by electrons. But in semiconductors, charge is carried by two different, uh, two different carriers. Uh, electrons, which are negatively charged, obviously, and holes, which are positively charged. In the next lecture, we're going to talk more about holes and electrons and where they come from and how they're used in semiconductors. This patterning step is how we create all these complex structures and wire them all together. Here's a, an image from IBM showing uh, copper wiring in, in a complex circuit. Many, many layers of wiring connecting millions, uh, now billions of transistors together. Two basic approaches for doing patterning. Again, we're going to talk about all these things in more depth as the semester goes on. But the first way of, of performing patterning is called subtractive patterning. Deposition plus lithography plus etch. I'll give you an example of subtractive patterning in the next slide. There's also an additive patterning process. Liftoff is one example of an additive patterning process. We'll mention that, uh, but not talk too much about it in this semester. Uh, damascene is very important. It's how we printed all these copper wires you see in the picture. It's an additive uh, patterning process. We'll talk more about that as the semester goes on. But let's take as an example a particular subtractive patterning process. We're going to make a polysilicon line, a polysilicon wire. Polysilicon means polycrystalline silicon. It's uh, silicon that's made up of grains of single crystal silicon. Uh, it's a very important material. And polysilicon is often used to make the gate, one of the electrical components of an MOS transistor. So the basic patterning sequence begins with deposition. So we'll cover the entire wafer with polysilicon. Then we'll do a lithography step. That means we'll deposit a photosensitive layer called a photoresist on top of that polysilicon. We'll take a photo mask with the pattern that we want to print and we'll use it to project an image of that photo mask onto the photoresist with light. We'll expose some regions of the photoresist and then develop in a, in a liquid developer those exposed regions and so they disappear. Then we'll use this photoresist pattern as a mask to etch away the polysilicon where we don't want it. When we strip away the resist, we've got a pattern in polysilicon that looks like the pattern we're trying to achieve. Repeat this process between 20 and 60 times and we'll make a chip. Let's see a little animation that shows this and work. First, we'll deposit polysilicon uniformly over the entire wafer, then coat the wafer with a photoresist material. We'll bring in a photo mask that has the pattern we want to print, shown here as the black line, and expose through that photo mask with light the resist. The exposed part of the resist will get washed away in a developer, leaving a resist pattern that looks like the original. Then we'll use that pattern as a mask for etching the polysilicon, strip away the photoresist, and we've got the pattern that we're looking for. Now there's a lot more to this lithography etch deposition steps than uh, what I've indicated here. And in fact, we're going to have multiple lectures on deposition, multiple weeks of lectures on lithography, and multiple lectures on etch as well to cover all the basics of those technologies. This picture is a cross section. If we look top down, of course, we'll see a, a, a two-dimensional pattern of this purple polysilicon material that can have any of a, a very complex shapes. And when we build up multiple of these patterns of different materials, 20 to 60 different uh, patterning steps, one on top of the other, 
uh, we can create very complex structures that turn into our integrated circuits. Besides lithography, there's different deposition techniques that we need to understand. And later in the semester, we'll talk about physical vapor deposition, things like sputtering and evaporation. We'll talk about chemical vapor deposition. Chemistry occurs in the vapor phase and materials are deposited uh, on the wafer or the, the ingredients for the deposition are in the vapor phase and the reactions are on the surface of the chemical, uh, on, on the surface of the silicon wafer, which is the more common approach. Uh, there's lots of different chemical vapor deposition techniques that we'll talk about in this class as well. And finally, we can oxidize silicon directly. We can grow silicon dioxide by apply, uh, supplying oxygen to a silicon wafer. And oxidation is a very important processing step as well. Etching, there's lots of different etch techniques as well. Uh, dry etching, plasma etching, reactive ion etching, and then basic wet chemical etching, things like using an acid to etch away uh, a metal. This patterning is then used to make our, our devices, our regions of selective doping, transistors, wires, insulators that go around the wires, and ultimately all of the circuits that will make up our chip. The other main processing step in making semiconductor devices is localized doping. And that involves patterning. So we begin by using that kind of patterning step we just mentioned before. Here's an output of a patterning step where I've got a silicon wafer and some silicon dioxide uh, regions on top of that. Then I will apply doping. I will introduce a, a dopant material. This is a material that's something different than silicon that we're going to embed in the silicon wafer. And the main method for doing that is ion implantation. What that means is we take the material we want to use to dope the silicon wafer and we'll ionize it. We'll use an electric field to accelerate those ions and then we'll bombard the wafer like shooting uh, bullets at the silicon, one atom at a time, shooting bullets at that silicon wafer. So. Uh, for example, we could dope with phosphorus ions. We could take these ions, accelerate them to hundreds of kilo electron volts. And these, these little projectiles, these ions, will slam into the wafer and embed themselves inside the wafer. They'll embed themselves inside the silicon dioxide and inside the silicon. But the silicon dioxide is a mask. It, it prevents the this dopant, these phosphorus ions, from reaching the silicon wafer in the region where it's masked by silicon dioxide. So only the unmasked regions get doped, that is, uh, introducing this, this phosphorus contaminant. When we're done with this ion implantation step, we've got all of these dopants in the silicon wafer, but we've done something else. We've completely disrupted the silicon crystal structure. We're going to talk more about silicon wafers and how they are a single crystal material. But when we implant these ions, bombard it, shoot ions into it, we bust up that silicon structure until it becomes amorphous. Amorphous materials are materials that have no crystal structure at all. So now we have this local region that's completely amorphous. Well, that's no good. We need a single crystal to create the semiconducting effect that we're looking for. So our next step is annealing, which is always accompanied by diffusion. We raise the wafer up to a high temperature. We allow the amorphous material to crystallize using the rest of the silicon wafer as a seed crystal, and thereby incorporate the dopants into the crystal structure. This results in a region of the silicon that's doped. In this guy, case, it's doped p-type. And again, we'll talk about what that means. It means the, the charge carriers are positive charge carriers for this particular dopant. And now we've got a region of silicon that's different from a doping perspective than the other regions of silicon. And that's what we need, local control of the dopant to create our transistors and our switches. 
So the combination of patterning and localized doping uh, allows us to build up these structures. So what are we making? The first thing we're making is transistors, uh, individual uh, components that act as switches in a circuit. But all of these switches get wired up together to form a circuit. Here's an example. This happens to be a Pentium chip from quite some time ago. But it still has millions of transistors on this chip. So it's a top-down view looking at the wafer. Uh, and then these chips are on a wafer. Wafers are round uh, uh, slices of silicon. They are reasonably thin. Uh, and on each wafer, we can make hundreds, sometimes even thousands of chips on one wafer. So each wafer has hundreds, thousands of chips. Each chip has millions to billions of transistors. The reason this works from a manufacturing perspective is we can do all of this in parallel. We can print and manufacture all of these transistors and all these chips on a wafer all at once. In fact, some of our processing steps, we won't just do one wafer. We might have 25 wafers in what we call a lot that are all processed simultaneously. This is mass production. We make billions of transistors, hundreds to thousands of chips on a wafer. And we have factories that can make wafers at the rate of 10 to 50 wafers a week. So this is serious mass production. It's why chips are everywhere. And we'll talk more about chips are everywhere in a future lecture when we talk about Moore's Law. But we have to always remember, this is not science. This is not uh, playing around in a sandbox. This is mass production. Chip making is manufacturing. All right, that's our lecture for today. Um, what have we learned so far? Here is a set of questions that uh, you should be able to fairly quickly answer if you've understood the material in this uh, lecture. I'll have these kind of quizzes at the end of every lecture, uh, say asking what have we learned. If you find that you cannot answer easily these questions, you need to go back and review the material to make sure you get it. So uh, define a semiconductor. Can you do that? What are the two important ways that locally change the conductivity of a semiconductor? What is patterning? Can you draw a basic diagram that outlines the steps of a subtractive patterning process? What is ion implantation? And why is annealing required after ion implantation? If you find, like I said, that all of these questions are, are not easily answerable right now, you should probably go back and review the lecture again. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.